YouTube now. Well, maybe we get started. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, we start with the seminar. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. We have a bit of te technical problem here with Sara Garcia Santa Maria that we hope will be soon be solved, so she could, so we can hear her uh, or listen to her. Well, welcome everybody to this uh, open lecture at the Institute of Latin, Nordic Institute of Latin American Studies. My name is Andres Rivarola and I am the director of the Institute. I am substituting today for Cristina Olneval that organized the seminar that unfortunately could not participate because she is ill. Uh, so uh, we say uh, our regards to Cristina and hope she gets better soon. Uh, a big thanks as always for David Garcia or a communicator that is doing all the technical things that make this possible. Uh, but uh, for today's open lecture, uh, the, the big thing and the great joy is to have uh, uh, Paola Sartoreto here orga that organized and will be the or moderator uh, of uh, this open lecture, Press on the Threat in Latin America dangers for journalists and backlash against democracy. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Paola, that will present the panelists. And I will also take the opportunity to inform on the coming open lecture that we will have the 6th of May uh, about uh, the global toxic waste, and slow violence and contaminated soil, a conversation on Arica with William Johansson and Lars Edman, Edman, that are directors of the documentaries Brie Bornen and Arica, of the pollution scandal in Chile. Uh, for you that want to receive our newsletters concerning the open lecture, I put it in the chat, the link where you could register yourself. So thank you very much for everybody. And I let the word now to Paola that will present our guest. Thank you everybody for participating. Thank you very much, Andres, um, and I'm very glad to present this very important seminar about uh, the threats to journalists in, in Latin America. So, to work as a journalist is dangerous in many Latin American countries. The recently published Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index shows that working conditions for journalists have deteriorated in the last year in some of the most popul popul populous Latin American countries, Brazil and Argentina. During Jair Bolsonaro's government in Brazil, uh, Brazil descended from a problematic situation to a bad situation, registering cases of hostility and violence against journalists. Mexico is still a deadly country for journalists. Reporter Without Borders highlights that threats to Latin American journalists are many and varied, including physical violence, vilification of journalism by politicians and abusive lawsuits. Although these threats target often individual journalists, they represent a broader danger to, to democracy as they attempt to silence and curb journalistic investigation and the scrutiny of power. I am Paula Sartoreto, Senior Lecturer in Media and Communication at Young Shopping University and former postdoctoral researcher at the Nordic Institute of Latin American Studies. I'm happy to virtually return to the Institute to discuss this worrying development with an outstanding panel of experts. So we have um, er Erik Haltjär, he is the president of Reporters Without Borders Sweden and editor of the magazine Onverden, which is published by the Swedish international aid agency, SIDA. We also have Sara Garcia Santa Maria. She is an associate professor at Universitat uh, Jaume uh, Primer, or Jaume the First, uh, and Sara's research focuses on journalists in restrictive context, contexts and um, journalist safety. And we also have Marcela Canavajo Martins. She is a lecturer at, at the Department of Public Policy Analysis at Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Rio de Janeiro, and she's a specialist in digital media intelligence. Um, 
we we will start with the presentations by our uh, by our panelists and open for questions from the public after the uh, in the in the Q and A. So if you see the Q and A button, that's where you you should um, you should write your questions. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat in English, Portuguese, Spanish, and Swedish, and but they will be translated to in, to English when we when we ask them to the panelists. And um, without so without f uh, further ado. I will invite our first um, panelist. Um, welcome, Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, I just say briefly, I, I feel a bit that my internet is, is uh, weak, so I beg, just have to be attentive. Uh, uh, I'll share my screen right away with uh, this year's uh, Press Freedom Index. Let's see if that works. Um, there we go. Uh, let's see. Can you make this in? Uh, there we go. I think. Yes. Um, we have. Uh, should just close this. Maybe there. We have uh, this world's press freedom index. Uh, uh, it was present just the other week, uh, and uh, it shows that. Uh, uh, this is the map of this year's uh, Press Freedom Index. Uh, and uh, briefly, I can say that uh, the press freedom all over the world is, is um, worsening. Uh, it's been, been like that for a few years now. Uh, so it's, may I always say it's harder. It, it's, it's hard to see that it can be any worse, but actually it can. Uh, what we see is that we have never seen so few countries uh, with a good situation, the white colored countries on this map. If you put your finger over Greenland, which is part of Denmark, you can you see for yourself how few those countries are. 12 actually. One of them, are, is it, or two of them actually are situated in Latin America and Caribbean. It's Costa Rica and Jamaica. Uh, we also have um, more countries that are colored red than orange, which is actually the whole situation more or less in, in Latin America. And what's happening overall here is that we have a, demo, a situation where democratic institutions uh, all over the world are uh, under attack or more authoritarian rulers are coming to power, populist rulers. rulers. We have an economic crisis where media have fewer resources to do journalism. It could be for advertisement, uh, loss of advertisement, or, or for the competition with the tech giants, the social media platforms, which is the other crisis, the technological crisis that we see, where we have these platforms taking more and more space from the traditional media platforms where you find the journalism. And then we also have a trust issue where we have uh, more people mistrusting traditional journalism. And we also have uh, the so-called geopolitical crisis, the countries black on this map, who not only are trying to suppress press freedom in their home countries, but they also try to suppress press freedom in other countries. China is the best example here. But to look into Latin America, uh, uh, which is today's uh, topic, we can see that uh, the, the most dramatic change over the year is uh, Brazil, uh, where the country is now falling down to the group of difficult situation countries, which makes this map look very, very much more red in Latin America. You always, you already find Mexico, Central American states in this group, Colombia, Venezuela. But actually, uh, uh, we can get back to this. Bolsonaro in Brazil, we will hear more about him in, in a while from another panelist. He more or less symbolizes actually this year's press freedom index. We say that the best vaccine 
against disinformation and the infodemic that we see when when we have a pandemic we often have an infodemic with disinformation misleading or fake news uh, and the best vaccine against this is of course traditional critis, critis, critica, uh, criticizing uh, uh, critical uh, and independent journalism brazil has lost four places in the ranking since last year but overall brazil has actually lost uh, uh, since the four five four five years has been falling down in the index so it's not just this year it's been going on the worst fall though we find in one of the smaller countries el salvador dropping eight places in the index and actually el salvador has dropped uh, almost 50 or 45 places in the rankings since 2014. this is only beaten by Nicaragua, who has fallen more than 50 places in the rankings in 2014. You can see if I can get back to the, yeah, here. Uh, here you can see the, all the countries in the index. And you can also see how they moved over the, the year. Uh, Honduras is another country. Uh, Honduras and Venezuela actually find among the the, the 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 red countries almost at the bottom close to the black colored countries where cuba is located since many many years uh, and then we have also the big countries mentioned by paola in the beginning argentina and chile for example are also seeing a problematic uh, 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 situation in the press freedom what is then the reason just in latin america you could say it's uh, it has a lot to do by of uh, corruption, widespread corruption, organized uh, crime, uh, often connected with the private sector. And when the journalists investigate the corruption or or uh, the linkage between uh, the the politicians or the, the the governments and the private sector, and also even maybe the organized crimes. Uh, you step into a nest where you most likely as a journalist will face threats, uh, legal consequences. Some of the, you will be filed for defamation, for uh, tax fraud. They will find all sorts of uh, issues they, they can to, to drag you into court. And they will try to keep you in court for such a long time that you at the end have lost all your resources or you don't you can't work as a journalist any longer it's it's a it's, it's kind of of, of uh, exhausting the resources of the the journalists uh, uh, and then we also have of course the violence which is manifested in mexico most of all uh, uh, still one of the world's most dangerous countries for journalists but we can also see this development in brazil unfortunately uh, Honduras, uh, Colombia, to mention a few countries. Um, so those are the main threats from a press freedom index uh, view. We also see um, uh, the, 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 the ownership is a problematic problem. We see more, that's always been a challenge in Latin America with a few owners of a lot of media in each country, but this is getting worse actually. And we also often see the media owners, the companies connected to other forms of businesses, which have connections maybe to economical crimes, fraud, or to the politicians in power, which make this into a very deadly cocktail. For a journalist, very interesting and, and important to look into, but also very dangerous. I think I'll stop there. Uh, uh, and I'll let, uh, if you have any questions later, you can, I can take. Thank you very much, Eric, for this very informative presentation. If you have, have a question, please, uh, there is a Q&A uh, button on the, on the bottom of the screen. So write your questions there. You can write questions in Portuguese, Spanish, Swedish and English, and uh, they will be translated to English. So now we go to our next panelist. Um, welcome, Marcella. Hi, Paola. Hi, everybody. 
Thank you, Eric, for these uh, very good contextualization of the situation here. I'm going to talk a little bit about Brazil. As you said, Brazil uh, is in the 107th position now. Uh, I mean, 111 position now and last year was 107 position, dropping four positions. And the report, the report points out that in the most cases, threatened journalists in Brazil were covering stories on corruption, public policies and criminal mafias, especially in small towns and middle-sized cities. Uh, this vi actually violence against journalists is covering historical problems in, in the Brazilian countryside is a long time situations, most time not addressed by the authorities. But in the last couple of years, we've seen uh, a, a, a change that is very uh, worrying because the most reported kind of, of threats is re are related to, to public affairs coming directly from the, the federal government. In 2020, uh, the previous report, Reporters Without Brothers counted 580, 580 attacks against the press coming from Bolsonaro family, which represents 85% of all attacks re reported. In fact, the president's family led last year ranking on hostilities against journalists in Brazil. And other senior members of Bolsonaro's administration, including ministers of state and the vice president himself, came just after his family, uh, his family members in the same rank ranking. Under Bolsonaro's administration, all kinds of communicators, including corporate media reporters, bloggers, citizen journalists, and others, have been humiliated, defamed, stigmatized, and insulted privately, online, and on national streams as well. Most of the attacks come on Twitter. Uh, Bolsonaro and his family's modus operandi uh, is to accuse the media of lying in order to attack his administration, when in fact the media is just doing their job, sometimes putting some light on Bolsonaro's own lies. Uh, so it's a kind of uh, curtain of smoke, you know, just to uh, quit the attention from him to, you know, other issues. I am not sure if everybody is aware, but besides the president, the family has other three prominent political figures, uh, one senator, one deputy, and one council member. They are all sons of Bolsonaro. Unfortunately, the family has millions of followers, both humans and bots, who loudly re reverberate each of their attacks, which increases the, the problem, right? And when directed to women, such official attacks are followed by misogynist threats to female journalists taken by Bolsonaro's followers. We know that social networks are kind of a nobody's land, right? Where all kinds of int intimidation have room and are reverberated as well. A notorious case of intimidation uh, against a woman took place in the second round of 2018 elections when Bolsonaro was elected, actually. Uh, Patricia Melo Campos uh, from the newspaper Folha de São Paulo, one of the biggest newspapers in Brazil, published a news piece on the professional network of fake news used by Bolsonaro in the presidential run to attack his uh, main opponent from the Workers' Party. At the time, he reacted, accusing the journalists of sexual favors to get information against him. And last month, he was convicted for that by the Supreme Court. One of his sons has also been convicted earlier this year for offenses against, against Patricia. She was massively intimidated on social networks after publishing this piece. Many of these attacks using sexual harassment, sometimes threatens to his life, his family's life. So it was like, it was huge. Another increasing situation in Brazil are abusive suits against reporters. That's something that reporters without broader, uh, borders have been denounced at least since the 2020 report. And now the Supreme Court is finally responding to it. That's maybe good news, but we have to see what's going on after that. So the Brazilian Press Association demanded the Supreme Court to take a position on this situation after many journalists being suited by Bolsonaro 
and his family. And the deadline given to Bolsonaro to explain why he is using the National Security Act to judicially uh, intimidate journalists is due by tomorrow. The National Security Act is dated from the dictatorship period in Brazil, the censorship time. And he's using the same act to intimidate journalists. We are not sure what, what comes after you know, his response to the, the Supreme Court, but Bolsonaro might have to give up on suing journalists for doing their job. Let's keep our eyes open as the situation unfolds. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm really hopeful on that, but at least it's a start, right? And before I finish, I would like to mention another silent threat that, that's going on in Brazil right now related to the pandemic. Brazil, as you all probably know, has been the center of the, the COVID pandemic for months. And journalists are, has, have been always in the front, but they rarely are considered as priorities in vaccination. There is no expectation that they will vac vaccinate anytime soon. And they are dealing with the horror of the pandemic on a daily basis when most of the common people can just turn off the TV or not read the news for a few days to get some rest. You know how tough it is for all of us, right? And besides that, they also have to deal with the emotional pressure of being exposed on a daily basis and sometimes um, under the risk of bringing it to their home, to their families. Right, and I am, I am punctuating this, this situation because we've been hearing from colleagues in the newsrooms uh, that they are in their limit. It is literally an emotional slaughter, I think, and, and we should also pay some attention to these emotional effects of the pandemic for journalists. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, highlight a few things and I'm open to questions after we finish this first round. Thank you very much, Marcela, for this very good insight in the situation in Brazil. And now we move over to, to Sara. We still don't hear you. Are you go are you going to connect again? Uh, I can I can maybe uh, start with um, with one question um, from uh, from the uh, from the panel um, just while Sarah is connecting again. Uh, let's just see if she got the the, the sound back. Nope. Sarah. So let's let's get let's uh, get a uh, pick one 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 question from the Q and A, uh, and that's a question from Pe Pedro Quiroga. Why the mistrust with the traditional media? Uh, and then we can Marcela I, and uh, Eric can. Uh, uh, I guess uh, it was since I mentioned this, uh, I can try and answer, and it's mm -hmm. fairly fairly simple. There, there's always been this. Historically, of course, people who don't trust the media, that does exist. Uh, but uh, what we have here with the social media platforms is a growing uh, platform or, or space for these people to manifest their mistrust and then gain ground uh, uh, within these closed group often on social media. And also what's happening is with the, with the social media and the fast internet is that journalists tend, unfortunately, to make more mistakes. They may, might miss a source. They might not do the fact check they, they should be doing. And when you do these mistakes, of course, you, you, you give some fire to the, to the, some wood to the fire of these people who doesn't trust media who don't trust media. And then also you have Bolsonaro, uh, Bukele in El Salvador, Donald Trump before in the States, who openly use this mistrust even in their public speeches, which of course make this, they reach a huge amount of people where this trust then 
I mean, the mistrust is even larger. So that's why we see, and of, of course, as you know, with Trump and Bolsonaro, they, they point to the traditional older media with the resources and they try to look at these smaller, often uh, um, politically backed media, I would say. Uh, it's not that nuanced, but to be short, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it is a deliberate strategy, right, Eric? What is going on sometimes in Brazil is that, let's say, the media reports, the Minister X, the Minister of Justice is going to, to you know, to quit the position. And then everybody, oh, the Minister of Justice is leaving uh, the bus, no? And five hours later, Bolsonaro comes, no, no, it's a lie from the media. They are, uh, that's fake news against my administration. And then his followers are like, you see how the media is lying. And then two days later, the Minister of Justice is uh, quits his, his position. So it looks like repeatedly they create the situation to mislead the, the, the press and then they do exactly what the press was, was telling. I think the last years of uh, political instability in Brazil um, hit very hard the, the press sometimes for their own mistakes, that's true. The ex, the former judge uh, Moro, Sergio Moro, who led the, the case against Lula, who convicted case and took him off the, the presidential run in 2018, was just judge partial and, and his, uh, his um, decisions were uh, canceled by the Supreme Court. And by the time there were many um, situations showing that that was going on, but the media didn't uh, question him the, at, you know, the, uh, properly. He was, the media, at, at most of the media was supporting his case, even though there was many, there were many, uh, many signals that there was something wrong. So I think, there is also uh, this part, uh, this option maybe of the media are these uh, difficult to co cover uh, so many situations going on in Brazil. So I think there is at one side uh, deliberate action to mistrust the media. And at the other side, sometimes the media is taking political positions when it should keep impartial. Thank you. Let's try again, see if Sarah can, we can hear Sarah now. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I finally connected from my phone. Well, thanks for your patience. Um, problem happened all of a sudden. Um, well, I would like to talk to you about um, the situation of the um, media in Latin America in general, and then focus on Cuba. As you know, it is the lowest ranked country. So I'm gonna explain a little bit why this is. I recently co-edited a book on media and governance in Latin America. And uh, when we were editing the book, we identified a series of problems that are common to all Latin American countries. Um, some of these problems have to do with, um, you know, the inconsistent, um, studies or the inconsistent proof of uh, journalism as a democratizing force in uh, new and transitional countries. For a long time, we thought that journalism, good journalism can um, drive a democratization of countries. There are a lot of mixed results actually, and this is the case in Latin America. Another problem is um, taking Western normative ideals as the rule. We try to look at journalism in Latin America and compare it to Western standards, forgetting as Sylvia Weisberg says, um, the context, forgetting um, the, the, the cultural practices, the professional practices, the, the socioeconomic context uh, that is specific to each country. So um, this, common areas that we found in Latin America in general, I'm gonna name six um, very briefly, are first of all market structures. Um, there is a concentration of ownership. Um, ownership is very elite driven and very connected to political interests in general. Another problem is uh, social inclusion. There is a crisis of representation um, in the media. Actually in 2010 already, um, 
Martin Barbero was saying that we have to move uh, beyond the, the idea of um, of a freedom of expression, but, but to also include this crisis of representation, to focus on the representation or, and the invisibility of uh, many marginalized uh, communities and societies in the country. These communication inequalities are another problem. There is a lack of civic oriented media outlets um, and uh, violence against journalists, threats against journalists. There is a persistent violence against reporters, but also there are a lot of factors that are um, making it very difficult for them to follow their normative ideals, which are usually Western normative ideals, such as um, their watchdog role. Another problem is uh, an extreme polarization of debates. And um, having said that, having a little bit of a, a broader image of what happens in the country, in the continent, I'm going to focus on Cuba. Um, Cuba ranks very low in the index. Um, there are many ways in which uh, threats against journalists manifest themselves in the island. I'm going to mention uh, just a few and then try to explain why they happen, although it's not, it's not easy. The most common charges um, that Cuban journalists face are helping the enemy. This has a lot to do with the funding of independent media outlets. They usually uh, need foreign media, uh, foreign funding from uh, foreign institutions, uh, universities, um, third sector um, NGOs, for instance, this foreign funding um, is a way of accusing them of collaborating with the enemy. Okay, you're an independent media outlet, you're being financed from abroad. So this is a global strategy um, orchestrated by the United States to actually um, organize a counter revolution. And yes, another um, charge they face very often is content. Um, for instance, when um, when um, a policeman tells an independent journalist to stop recording because they're not allowed to do so and they keep filming, they can be um, charged with contempt. Another curious one is the usurpation of legal capacities. Um, the only legal exercise of journalism in Cuba is uh, for the state-owned media outlets. So all independent practice um, is forbidden, um, legally forbidden. Um, all journalists are required to belong to the Cuban Union of Journalists, which is linked to the state. So as an independent journalist, even if you graduated uh, in journalism at a Cuban university, you cannot be a member of this union. It's impossible. You're not accepted as a member. If you're not a member of the union, you're not legally allowed to exercise journalism. So when you are reporting on the street as an independent journalist, the police can come to you and say, um, excuse me, but I don't see your membership. Um, so you're not, um, you're not allowed to exercise journalism even more. You're usurpating um, legal journalists capacity, a legal capacity to, to, to report. Um, recently, there's been a lot of charges as well for the propagation of the pandemic linked to the COVID-19 um, crisis. If you're reporting, and once again, you're not authorized to do so, they can charge you of not following um, the legal uh, social distancing or, or other measures um, that are required for um, keeping um, the pandemic under control. Another charge that is very common is just accusing a, jour a journalist of a common crime, um, for instance, of theft. Um, even if this is unproved, uh, there's been cases in which intellectuals or, or, or journalists were accused of like a common crime. And um, well, this, yes, this basically puts you in a very ugly situation. Um, but there's also many other consequences of exercising journalism in Cuba that are not just uh, as visible or as clear. Um, in general, when you're an independent journalist in Cuba, um, the state tries to um, not just harass you as an individual, but also harass your family and your friends. So there is um, this uh, 
movement for isolating you from your social circles. All of a sudden, a friend stops talking to you, or your parents are very angry at you because the police is going into your job and asking too many questions. So this social isolation is very, very important. Um, journalists find out that the police is not only waiting for them at the door of their house, they also go to their relative's house. Um, there's also um, confiscation of their equipment, their cameras, their recording material um, can be confiscated and this is legal and they basically lose a lot of material but also economic resources there. There's arbitrary arrests, but there's no trace of them. Um, so you can be arbitrary arrested. Um, some journalists say they are kidnapped because um, there's no apparent reason for this arrest, but you cannot trace it. This creates a lot of um, mistrust. You hear that your colleague was arrested. Where is the proof? How can you know this happened? How, you, how can you actually know if this uh, arrest was uh, violent or not? There's no trace. Um, there's also a lot of uh, psychological distress. Um, I've been interviewing Cuban independent journalists for many years and they all report fear, paranoia, and a huge sense of vulnerability. And finally, there's also travel restrictions for um, some journalists and intellectuals. They're, they don't know that, they just simply go to the airport and they find out that they cannot leave the country. And sometimes they cannot leave the country for five years. So there's also this pressure of, well, if I'm too critical, maybe they're gonna put me in a list and I won't be able to leave Cuba. All this happens, um, for two main reasons. Obviously, the most um, obvious reason is the, the lack of legality. Uh, the exercise of independent journalism in Cuba is not legal. Actually, there's been a, strength, a strengthening of the legislative framework to present uh, the exercise of journalism or independent journalism as a crime for linking journalists to delinquency. Um, we've had a new constitution in 2019, a new communication policy as well, as and administrative punishments, a lot of decree laws that make it much faster and easier uh, to apply than the penal code. One of them is the uh, decree law 349, which has uh, had a huge impact on journalists. Um, also, the government, uh, oh, sorry, I wanted to say that um, constitutionally speaking, um, freedom of the press is legal, um, but it's conditional. It is conditioned to the law and um, the good of society. So there's a lot of um, a lot of um, restrictions that are not very clear. Okay, there's freedom of expression, but then there's all these conditions that you have to follow. And if you don't follow them, um, if you don't follow the common good, or if you attempt against the common good, then you can be punished. Um, there's also a list of jobs that you can exercise independently, privately in Cuba. There's 2000 jobs that you can exercise independently, but there's 124 that you can't. And among them, there is journalism as well as other artistic and cultural activities. Um, so legal problems are, are very obvious, but there's also a problem of legitimacy. Not, not the access of, of independent uh, journalism is not just illegal, it's also illegitimate. Um, in Cuba, actually, um, independent journalists or activists, um, they've been labeled as mercenaries, as working for the US government, as getting foreign funding and having other interests. Um, um, but also, there's a lot of political insults that come from being a centrist. Being labeled a centrist by the government is bad. You cannot be at the center of the political spectrum. In fact, a lot of journalists consider that the government tries to polarize you, to push you to the extremes of uh, the political um, ideology, but also to push you to the extremes of your emotionality, to destabilize your emotionality. So you become less rational if you feel a lot of anger, a lot of, um, um, you know, humiliation, as we were saying before, you're 
easier to discredit. You are easier to label, label as an extremist and to be uh, taking your legitimacy as a journalist away. This is what the government has done with, as I was saying, um, activists. Activists are seen as emotionally taken and following foreign interests. And therefore, they're seen as unable of exercising um, objective journalism or professional journalism. Um, okay, finally, um, there's been a lot of uh, smear campaigns on national television and social media against journalists and, uh, well, some of them, well, a lot of people consider that there is a troll factory in, in Havana and uh, that is um, orchestrated by the government. So that's, that's everything I wanted to share with you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And I'm going to move straight, um, uh, straight to the questions because we have some. Um, and there's one question here, which I think maybe Eric can answer. Uh, I'm wondering why just Costa Rica and Jamaica are in white color. And also how a country like Jamaica, which with its poverty and level of corruption can be in white color. Absolutely. Uh, I was actually prepared for that question. <laughs> uh, uh, Costa Rica, first of all, I would like to mention, it's not only the fact that they're on fifth place that should be recognized. They have actually moved up for uh, seven years from place 21 in the ranking so Costa Rica is definitely doing very well but if we don't do something in the Nordic countries we will soon see Costa Rica being better than us and that is for the simple reason that uh, journalists in Costa Rica are pretty free to work without interference from the state from organized crimes uh, um, from threats. Uh, it's, a, it's a country where media and the press freedom is very, very uh, central, I think, for people in power and the politicians. It's, uh, still, I would like to say, looking into the context that might not last, but hopefully it will. Jamaica, as, as you say in the question, is uh, lots of poverty and, uh, and corruption. But more or less the same goes there. Media and journalists are pretty free to do to do their work, and the state seldom interfere into the work, and, and neither does the private sector. Uh, and the violence is high in Jamaica, but not against journalists. Uh, uh, so that's why they actually are placed this high in this index. Uh, um, uh, though Jamaica, I would like to say, is the reason Jamaica is, if you look into the details of this index, you can actually see that Jamaica is, doesn't really move in the index. It just mm -hmm. jumps up and down, but it's more or less same points over the years. Thank you. Next question, I think, is for everyone. Uh, it's about in um, the, the Journalist Federation in Colombia has recently public, published an, uh, an study in, in which it, that shows that um, it's three uh, family, uh, family companies that attain 80% of all the digital media uh, and um, broadcast and written media in, in the country. Um, and it's the same kind of concentration in Peru and, uh, and in, as we know, in many other countries of Latin America. So here is the $1 million question. What do we do with the problem of concentration of, um, uh, com uh, media, and com uh, of, of media and uh, the relation of the media company companies with power? So whoever wants to start, welcome. I, I can well, start uh, 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 or Marcella, please. No, I, I don't want to. Uh, uh, feel free. I was trying to open my microphone. I was a little bit late, mm -hmm. but feel free if you want to start answering. Uh, I was going to say that the situation is very similar in Brazil. Uh, I was trying to find one previous report from uh, Reporters Without Brothers. I think it's from 2013, and the report was named The Country of 30 Berlusconi's something like that, in reference to Berlusconi, the former president from Italy, 
Berlusconi, who was uh, who who owns a media conglomerate, at least at the time he was president. And in Brazil, it's similar, but it's kind of uh, there is a regional share, let's say. So in northeast, there are. I don't know, two, three, four families. In the southeast, there are other number of families, but it's very, very concentrated. Most of these families are also politicians, which makes the situation even worse. And I mean, the diagnosis, I think everybody uh, is relatively aware of, but what could we do to change this situation? In my opinion, just apply the constitution because the constitution, um, uh, rules that it's not allowed. And um, a few years ago, the government tried to, to pass the regulation. I mean, there is this, um, this uh, rule in the constitution, but it was not uh, ruled by, how can I say, uh, uh, infraconstitutional laws. You know, to apply what the constitution uh, says, we have to to detail all all these situations in infraconstitutional laws, and it it ha has been never done because it's not of the interest of the Congress. Because of course, these families are politicians, are senators, are deputies, or are very close friends of them. So there is no political interest in doing so. A few years ago, the government uh, tried to, to pass a new law on this, and it was accused of censorship, of, you know, it was the workers' uh, party uh, administration. I'm not sure now if it was under Lula or Dilma, but both of them were, were uh, strongly attacked for that. And he was, they were accused of trying to censor the, the, the press. And if it was doing in the right way, of course, there is a risk when you rule about the press, there is always the, the risk that there were that that there are some bad uh, situations um, being, you know, uh, some people will try to bring bad uh, laws into these act. But I mean, if it's well done if we do it with resp responsibility i think we would create a much healthier uh environment media environment in brazil and i believe there is a similar situation in other countries in latin america because in theory we we do know what we have to do but when it comes to put into into practice there is this strong um elite powers that impede us to go forward but i think it's a simple uh, simple answer, just apply the constitution. I, 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 I can just uh, also mention, I think I agree with Marcella that we need to, I mean, the, 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 the constitution should be applied in many countries in Latin America and also the importance of an independent publisher. We have to remind ourselves, which we tend to forget, that in Sweden, we have five companies who own 90% of all the newspapers. We have a very high media uh, concentration on ownership concentration in Sweden. But what we have in Sweden, which is often lacking in Latin America and other countries, is an independent, strong independent publisher who can tell the owner that, well, thank you for the money and the resources, but I will make my newspaper how I want to. Uh, and and the owner won't fire the editor when they when they scrutinize the owner. Uh, and also another thing is uh, transparency. Uh, a report without borders has been helping Fundación para la Libertad de Prensa in Colombia for many years, uh, and they have, uh, with our help, uh, made a, a web page called the Pauta Visible which you can find on the internet in Colombia, where you can see who is financing what media all over the country. Uh, and that also makes it more open for everybody to know and see who is paying for the, the media or the content and the news in, in different uh, uh, media outlets, which I think also will make people more aware of the situation and they will act accordingly, uh, hopefully. But it's a, it's a long process and it's difficult. Uh, also, like I spent a lot of time in El Salvador. I lived in El Salvador, worked in El Salvador. There were two newspapers, radio stations that we sort of, they were 
connected <laughs> to, to the government for many, many, many years. Uh, El Diario de Hoy in El Salvador, which was like the worst right-wing conservative, whatever you will call it, you can find, is now one of the best independent and investigative journalists uh, outlets in the country. And this is because they've been inspired by new media outlets like El Faro and other new digital media platforms that investigate and do lots of good work. And I think other newspaper are inspired by that and see what actually independent journalism can achieve. Uh, so I think that you, that you, we can be optimistic, but it's still lots of challenges to uh, ahead in this question. Um, I wanted to add something over the last decade or so. There's been a wave of uh, media reform in a lot of Latin American countries. They were aware of these problems and they tried to solve uh, media concentration. In some of these countries, such as Ecuador, they even established uh, quotas for television and radio frequencies, giving 33% of the quota um, to public media outlets, 33% to private ones, and 33% to community media. Um, this sounds really good, and you would think, well, this is a big step um, towards solving media concentration. The problem is that a lot of these media reforms that were also captured by political and economic interests. And uh, this capture of um, the media by, by politics and by um, the economic elite is just so deeply rooted um, that legislation itself um, becomes a victim sometimes. So. Uh, we have time for one last question. Um... And uh, I will actually, uh, uh, and that, that's about exactly about uh, Cuba. And uh, given this, um, the, uh, what you told about the lack of liberties for press in Cuba, in Cuba uh, my impression is that the democratic society and no, no, uh, non-democratic society, the situation is very similar for journalists. Um, how do you see the future for the profession? Um, well, thanks for the question. I just wanted to highlight that um, in Cuba, there is there are professional journalists who work for the state-run media, and there are professional journalists who work for independent media outlets. Um, this is important to recognize because there's a lot of people, um, you know, who are not independent journalists who decided to to, to work for the state because they believe in a in an internal reform. They they believe in change and they think this reform is possible from within the system and then there's people who got tired of waiting for this were um inside led reforms and decided to quit the system and to, to try to exercise good quality journalism outside um the solution um well that's a uh, very interesting well, the solution is that independent media outlets are here to stay, even if uh, the state has uh, trying to make them illegal. Um, they, they keep working um, with a lot of economic struggle and personal uh, struggle, but uh, they haven't disappeared. And a lot of them have been um, focusing on, on the quality of journalism, on investigative journalism, on data journalism. They want a lot of uh, international words. So the proof that is that there are talented journalists and that there is uh, a will um, of exercising good quality journalism. And hopefully this is stronger than um, the state's uh, attacks against uh, against journalists and, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, we have just time for one more question that came here, and I think uh, and that um, have international support in all its form, solidarity statements, projects for professional development, etc., made any difference for journalists and journalism in Latin American countries where the situation of press freedom has deteriorated? Any more examples of high impact, good re results, apart from the one mentioned by er uh, Eric? I would say that in Brazil, we've been seeing a very impressive um, new environment of media. Uh, we call something like entrepreneurship journalism or 
you know, there are many new outlets there, uh, Ponte, as an agência pública, even the Intercept that has these, you know, more corporate support behind it, but it's been extremely important in bringing to light uh, Sergio Moro's situation that I mentioned before and many others, human rights uh, issues. There are so many important topics and also some topics related to the, the, the journalist's routine itself. Uh, Sometimes it's not highlighted in the, in the, the, the me, uh, in corporate media groups, like the, the big ones, and they are in the agenda of these new outlets. So I would say it's extremely important to have uh, more financing and more um, interchange of experiences between uh, journalists in Latin America and other countries especially within Latin America, you know, because we are in the same, kind of in the same situation, but also uh, exchange with uh, professionals in, in the global north and um, financing as well to, to bring these new initiatives here. Because as we know, this huge concentration uh, in the hands of a few groups has been for decades. It's very hard to, you know, to, to surpass this barrier. So it's very important to have the international support to, to you know, to help to, to grow these new and vibrant media environments. I have to, to leave to my next seminar, but, but I can quickly add that uh, 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 it's, as, as Marcella says, uh, I have seen some very good examples of on networking, where, where the international community can facilitate for journalists to, to network and to learn from each other or inspire from each other in the region. But I also see uh, international fin finance. I mean, I would uh, once again, then uh, El Faro and El Salvador are themselves creating a space for the digital media in Central America and even Colombia, Mexico. Uh, so it's one. It's part of their curriculum. It's part of their work. They want to create these platforms for other journalists in other countries, uh, and hopefully we can see the same. In I, I know there are the same things in Colombia, uh, as Marcela says, in Brazil. Uh, that's, I think that's a very good way of of, uh, of helping because there's no lack of good journalists. As, as Sarah says, in Cuba, even there are very good lot, lot of good journalists. I will I, leave now, so I will just say thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye, yeah. Eric. Thank bye, you. Bye, bye. Thank bye. you. I, I would just, I would just add the importance of seats and collective media groups, uh, especially in, uh, as you all, all know, especially in Rio, we have the situation of these huge favelas where many times even huge corporate uh, media groups can't go in because it's dangerous because they are not used to it it's on top sometimes because it is prohibited you know the, the 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 company prohibited reporters to go there when there is a conflict just for their safety so the dwellers that are there already they are reporting outside the favelas and corporate media are using these materials for their own coverage. So I would say it's very, very important to focus on these groups as well, not just um, enterprises, just companies that are legally, you know, uh, created, but these um, non-officials or alternative or however, or media activist groups, however you, we can call them, them, they are very, very important to guarantee not only the, the human rights inside the favela, but also our right to access the information from there. It's a, an increasing situation and it has been making some difference. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, the Brazilian Supreme Court has also, has already used some of these materials in one of their decisions about police, um, uh, police activities in the favela. So it, it shows how important it is to have these uh, testimonials from inside. Sorry, I think you were about to say something before we finish. 
No, I just wanted to um, to restate what they said. I believe that uh, international collaborations, international networks, um, gatherings are very important for journalists to, um, you know, um, create collaborative learning, but also support networks. Um, and uh, it helps them actually sustain um, quality alternative media outlets. Thank you very much. And with that, I think we can end this very fruitful seminar. I would like to thank uh, to, to thank all the, the Marcella and, and Sarah and Eric has left us and uh, thank all the participants. And uh, I really hope that uh, in the near future, we can meet again at the, the Institute, the, the Latin American Institute Library, which is such an important place for all uh, uh, Latin American interested people here in Stockholm in Sweden and in the Nordic countries. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a good evening. Thanks, Thanks a, a lot, lot for the invitation. For the invitation. Thank you. Bye. Good evening and see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.